Let's pray. Father, there is a truth that we stand on and sing of and now praise you in prayer for, that you are a God worthy of being praised. We can sing about blessing your name because your name is blessed. We can call you holy because you are. We can call you good because that's, that's what you are for us day in, day out. So bless the Lord. And we can say to ourselves, bless the Lord, O my soul. It's right and appropriate for you to be blessed, and it is good for us to bless you. You've set that up, you have made that so, and we say thank you. And then move beyond that to ask, not just to praise you, but to ask of you, which is honoring to you itself. To ask you, will you work here now in the midst of us, in this this moment in front of us and this passage that's before us, will you work here to grow us up in understanding of you, to grow us up in how you, understanding how you work with us and in this world. And at the end of it, Lord, would you then draw out from our hearts yet more blessing of your name and more resting in who you are. Help us to think well and carefully in a God-honoring and joy-producing way. Spirit, would you do that this, this morning here in our midst over this text right now? We trust ourselves to you and say thank you, Lord. You are good. Amen. One of the things that human beings like least is being told what to do which creates a problem for us because as we grow up, we are constantly bumping into people, more and more and more people who tell us what to do. Creates a a constant confrontation. And that's because God made the world a place full of authority. Intentionally so, rightly so, God made the world a place full of authority. And I repeat that because that's, part of the key in helping us deal with the problem we have with human authority that stands over us. To look through it or past it, you might say, and on to the God who put it there and to trust him ultimately, not it or them here on earth, to entrust ourselves to him who reigns through and as these other human beings are reigning over us wherever that authority is, in the home, in the workplace, in in society, in government, wherever that authority lies, it's there because God established it, empowered it, and calls us then, his people, to submit to it. According to the relevant guidelines, Wherever that authority works or their guidelines, it's important to say that because this call to submission, it exists in a context and it needs a little bit of qualification, just a little bit. We'll talk about that this morning and in coming weeks. But in general, the important base, the important starting point is not with the qualifiers, it's with the realization that even as Christians, sojourners and exiles here in the world, outcasts whose real citizenship is in heaven, even as Christians, that's us. We saw this again last week in the middle of 1 Peter chapter 2. We're still here called to live under human authority in the world. Doing so serves a divine purpose. It's for the Lord's sake, as we'll see. We are to submit to human authority, to, to human authority of all sorts. And this week, in particular, we're going to talk about government. That's where Peter takes the conversation this morning in verses 13 to 17 of 1 Peter chapter 2. So we're going to read these verses, and then we'll consider two observations from them. It's 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. 
For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. First Peter chapter 2. Two observations from that passage. Here's the first. Mindful of God, we must submit to human governing authority. Mindful of God, we must submit to human governing authority. Verse 13 begins with the main command of the passage, be subject. Or you could say be submissive or submit to. Lots of different ways you could put that, but it's all basically the same point. It's a command, and it's not a statement of fact, which is a, a subtle but important observation. This is not just a statement of, since you are subject to people, let me help you deal with that. It's a command, something we are to do. Be subject. The word comes from a military context, and it means what it sounds like it means. You can kind of look around, figure out who's what and where, and then when you've established where you're supposed to be in the proper lines of authority, put yourself properly in line beneath or under the one who's in charge of you. And have an attitude, not just a, a formal obedience to, it implies that of course, but also to have an attitude of being beneath. So you're submissive in, in action and in word and in attitude also. It gives a proper respect and a deference to authority. Who doesn't act like, hey, I'm probably in charge here, because you're not. And reveals that you know you're not in charge. And you, you're not going to assume that. And you're going to show respect. You're to act in submission to whom? Well, the verse continues. Subject to every human institution. And while he's about to give two examples from government, because that's his focus, every human institution is more than just government. It's every human situation in which there is assigned authority. And every one of those where Christians find themselves... They are to be subject to that authority for the Lord's sake, it says. That is the Lord Jesus' sake. He has a purpose in our submission. There's something that's here that's for him. That's about him. We're going to talk a little bit more later what that purpose is, but it's easy enough to say, like, right out of the gate, that if it's for the Lord, if it's for Jesus, well, then... Anything that's for Jesus, we know automatically, can't be sinful. We are never called nor allowed to sin for Jesus. So there's the one qualifier. And it's important that we note that it's a qualifier, and it's important that we note it's the only qualifier. Be subject unless it involves us sinning. Put yourself beneath the authority in every human institution as long as you are not commanded to sin. As long as you're not being commanded to break God's law, as best we understand at the moment, by either commission or omission. This is the classic definition of sin. Something that breaks God's law by committing something that God forbids or omitting something he requires. Commission, omission. So, as long as the civil authority, the ones who are over us, whatever they are, are not commanding us to break God's law as best we understand it, this is going to be always a little bit inexact because a 10-year-old is going to understand what God requires different than a 40-year-old. A very immature Christian is going to understand what God requires differently than a mature Christian. But it's important that we be clear that 10 or 40, immature, immature, but what we're doing is we're trying to push it back towards what does God's law require of me? Command or forbid? Not, how do I feel about it? Not, I prayed about it, I don't have a peace about it. Does God's law forbid or command? Not, I think he's leading me to. What does the law, what does God's word command in forbidding or 
telling you to execute. What, what is the word saying as best you understand it? That's the qualifier. And if there isn't any conflict between what the human authority is requiring of me and it contradicts what God's requiring of me or forbidding of me, if there isn't, isn't any requirement, be subject. But if, if there is, then like Peter himself said in Acts 5, we must obey God, not man. You see the qualifier there. That's, that's the one qualifier. And that can be pretty challenging. Even when we're just talking about some of the human institutions that we're in kind of temporarily or voluntarily, you know, the, the class with the teacher that you're going to be out of there in six months anyway. The homeowners association that you get out of when you move away. That, it's challenging at that level, but it gets pretty significantly challenging when we start talking about civil government, which you can't get away from. And that's actually Peter's focus here. Be subject to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. Literally, it's sent through him. The terms here fit the Roman Empire perfectly. That's where Peter lived. That that's his context in which he's writing. The supreme ruler in the empire would have been the emperor, also called the Caesar. And the Caesar then sent governors to the various provinces in the empire, people like Pontius Pilate. He was a Roman governor. They were sent through him to these smaller regions. And interestingly, if you think about technically the sent through him, it makes you kind of wonder, ultimately, through him, by whom? And there's just a little drop of a hint there that lines up with a lot of other things we read about in the scriptures. We, you can think easily of Romans 13 where Paul talks about a similar subject. Yes, indeed, the emperor is making the decision. The emperor is sending the governor to go here and there and, and you carry out my will as I'm expressing it through you, governor. But ultimately, the one that sets up emperors and governors is God. The one who sends through the emperor is God. Carrying out his will, ultimately. All authority comes from him, we know, ultimately. Sent by God, then, as Caesar sends him, the governor arrives to do what? Not just to boss people around, but it, but it says to punish those who do evil. Literally, that means to enact vengeance, to make pain happen for those who do evil, and, on the flip side, to commend those who do good, to honor them, to, to uplift them, to encourage them. There, so there's the purpose of government in a real simple nutshell, to create order and safety in society by hurting those who do evil and commending and enabling and empowering those who do good. That's why the emperor sends. That's why God sends through the emperor to make society more good and less evil by law, by force, by coercion. Not just by teaching or by modeling and certainly not by the spirit at work in one's heart. If you think again of Romans, Paul talks about the sword. Government has the hard power of the sword, which means ultimately the ability to take life. And it has the soft power of encouragement and reward and commendation so as to kind of incentivize good behavior. Government serves this purpose by law and by force, to bless society, to enable good and put down evil. Perfectly? Come on. Of course not. <laughs> right? Of course not. It still is, in the end, a human institution. It's people. Fallen and broken, and so every attempt to punish, to inflict pain on evil is going to get the pain wrong, and in fact, it's going to get the definition of evil wrong. And to commend good, it's going to get the definition of good wrong, too. It's, it's going to get it all wrong. It's, it's going to mess it up. This is, this is people. In every case, everywhere, that is always going to be the case until the king and the kingdom comes. It is always 
going to be imperfect. It's never going to happen exactly right. So when you see it happening not right, that doesn't void this. That's assumed. It's baked in. Peter, who wrote this, saw a Roman governor cave to public opinion and intimidation and expediency and execute Jesus, right? He saw that with his own eyes. Peter lives in Rome under the emperor Nero, who was remarkably wicked and probably literally insane. His, his evil was so twisted, he probably was mentally ill. Peter lived there and died there under the emperor, as did Paul. He was very, very, very aware that the emperor and his governors can get it wrong. But by God's common grace, God sends emperors and sends governors, and sometimes they got it right, of course, right? Read the book of Acts. Paul was twice rescued by Roman governors. And during the Pax Romana, instituted by the Roman sword, the roads of the Roman Empire were at peace, and so people could walk back and forth safely, including Christian missionaries, and carry the gospel everywhere without fear. That was made by the Roman government. So the Roman government is good and evil. It's wise and foolish. It's incredibly corrupt and licentious. And the rule of law mostly holds. It's a mix, like every human institution is. It's a good and bad collage. And Christian, for the Lord's sake, be subject to it. the good and the bad, be subject. As long as you aren't required to sin, it doesn't mean you feel like it's sinful. Is it sin or not? It doesn't mean as long as you're not allowing them to sin. It's am I being required to sin? Do what the authorities command and require of you. That's the word to us today. Civil governments of all levels, we're called to obey them in our words and our actions and in our attitudes to be submissive. And we have to consider that, but we have to consider particularly in our American context. We think about applying this, our, our context comes into play, and this is where it might be different than in other countries in the world. A context, not the qualifier. There's only one qualifier, the are you being required to sin or not. So this is, this is not a context that lets us off the hook and says, don't obey. It's a context that shapes how we are subject, how we are submissive. In the United States, we live in a context with multi-layered governments that all share interrelated power and are not at all strictly top-down. The president does not send the governor to do what the president says in our context, as an example. And we know that all those different layers, they all rule and sometimes speak, sometimes in contradictory or conflicting ways with one another. They're, they're not all in lockstep. That's all by design. And if any one of those layers ever commands or requires or, or speaks of something that we kind of disagree with or kind of wonder about or think is unjust or unconstitutional, there is recourse there is established legal recourse in our system. There are in all governments. You remember how Paul on trial in Judea said, I make my appeal to Caesar? And they said, okay. They had recourse. Every government does. We have the ability to argue. It's baked into the system. It's part of how it works. You can't just say, I know better. I'm not doing that. And you, you can't say, I like their rule over there in that other state better. I'll do that one. You can't do that. But you can, for instance, you, you can go down to the city hall and argue your case. Now, I'm not a lawyer or a judge. I'm not going to get in the weeds here. Don't worry. But you, you can go down and, and you can argue your case, right? And you can protest and you can file a lawsuit and you can appeal it to a higher court. There, there is recourse in our system. And all of that is part of the system and can be engaged in submissively. In attitude, 
or it can be engaged in very arrogantly and with rebellion. And there's only one option for the Christian. You engage in that system. Engage in the, the seeking of recourse if you want to. Yes, while being subject to the authorities placed over you. That's how we have to think about these, these requirements of us. We, in an American context, have some unique abilities and some unique options to us, but we have to engage in them submissively. So, American Christian, consider your heart, particularly as you find yourself seeking recourse or disagreeing and trying to change opinions. And one way you might come to understand your heart is by noticing what happens when you lose. At the end of the day, there is an end to the process. And when the appeal is denied and the verdict against you stands, against us all stands, we're not allowed to reject it anyway because we are sure it's wrong. Wrong decisions, again, are assumed by Peter here and not relevant. He lived in Rome. He gets wrong. We have to obey God rather than man if man is trying to tell us to disobey God. But if not, to obey God is to obey man. Be subject to the men and women who rule the human institutions over us. Now, I realize that probably this is all just completely hypothetical for all of us. Because we're just fine with government and we can't think of anything in the last year or two that might have been a challenge for us. But you know, hypothetically speaking, try to imagine some sort of crazy situation where the authorities in your workplace and the administrators at your school and the, the city officials and the county leaders and the state legislature and the governor and the House and the Senate and a presidential administration or two all get wrapped up in some gigantic furball where day after day after day after day they're issuing edicts and opinions and laws and rules and rulings back and forth that push this way and that. Some of them derive from fear and from folly and some from wisdom and from statistics and, and good ideas and bad ideas, some driven by political interests, some driven by money, some driven by a care, a care and a concern for people. And back and forth you go. I generally don't like making up hypothetical examples because nobody can identify with them. But try to imagine something like that. <laughs> and if you can get it in your mind, how do you think you would react? How would you respond towards these multiple layers of governments and this ways and this ways and that days the back and forth, how would you do with that? How might your attitude seep out through the cracks? Can you imagine that the people who live in your house and hear you talk might describe your attitude towards the authorities over you? What about the people who monitor your social media? What would they say maybe? You, you are bent in which way towards whom? How would they see that? Not, not what are your opinions, but, but how are your opinions? There is a lot at stake. The second point is coming up. There is a lot at stake in this command. God has a purpose in it. And it is just possible that in such a hypothetical scenario, if that were to happen, that we would easily lose sight of the forest for the sake of the trees and argue our American rights. 
and blow it. I'm not saying you're not American, you don't have rights. That's part of the system. You do. But how we pursue the, the adjudication of what our rights are and how they will be administered, how? There's a lot at stake in doing it submissively. That's what takes us to the second point. This submission that we're just talking about in the first point, this submission commends the gospel as it honors people while trusting in God. So this submission, the first point, commends the gospel as it honors people while trusting in God. Verse 15, for, because this is the reason that we were just commanded like we were. Be subject to the governing authorities because this is the will of God. This is what God wants. This is God's plan. Continues. That you'll silence foolish people by doing that. By doing that good. God's plan is that when we do the good of subjecting ourselves to the civil authorities, when we do the good of showing ourselves to be good citizens, part of the fabric of society, not those tearing it apart, uniters and not rebels, team players, not, not lone wolves of some sort, civil, not enraged and oppositional, we play within those rules fairly and we live with the final consequences peaceably and amicably and submissively. Maybe not happily because we don't like the final consequences. We don't have to like that. We can object to it. But at the same time, when, when we live with those final consequences, we live with it as being really okay with it, not sore losers. God's plan, his will is for us to do that so as to silence the ignorance of foolish people. You see that right there in the verse. God's, God's people are constantly facing people who are constantly saying that we aren't all of that. We aren't those who are the fabric of society. We are those tearing it apart. We aren't good. We are evildoers, in fact. We only care about ourselves, not others. And we only think of ourselves in such a high and mighty way. And we make it double worse because we say God is on our side and God wants us to be like this. The hypocrisy of it all. There's nothing actually any different in us, they say, because we're just another affinity group and we're just another like a category or another club and you all, you want exactly what you want just like we do and you, you get angry and you're threatened and you get threatening when you don't get it just like we do. And you say God's on your side, which makes it double worse, but, but really in the end there's nothing different in you because there's nothing actually to what it is you're talking about. It's just another human construct. You were raised with that, so you were taught this is how you should be, but there's nothing to it. It's just how you are, your, your culture. That reputation constantly arises. That misunderstanding constantly springs up, and if we're honest, it's partially, because it's partially our fault. It's not all our fault. It's folly and ignorance on the part of other people. But it is partially our fault because people who have named the name of Jesus have lived like that. Let's be honest. It's constantly springing up, and God wants that continually shot down and proven false as we, by us, living, verses 13 and 14. So that those who have eyes to see, not everyone will have eyes to see, but God will give eyes to see in some people. They'll have eyes to see the good deed of submission to authority, playing the game with a heart that is at rest and submissive, and they'll realize, you know, actually the Christians that I know are model citizens. They're not a problem to govern at all. 
even though they're quite clearly not getting their way. I, I, I get that. But it's almost as if, almost as if, they're in the end kind of fine with not getting their way here on earth. It's almost as if they're not living for this earth like we are. Hmm. It, it's almost as if they don't need a certain outcome. If they want one. I, I know what it is. They talk about it. They argue for it. They, they campaign for it. They, they ask. It's, but they don't seem to need it. And I can tell because of how they are when they don't get it. They seem okay with that. Not, not okay, but okay with it. I wonder what the reason is for the hope that seems to be within them. How do they do that? Well, the gospel is the only way we do that, of course. That's the only way. We're no different than anybody else, but the gospel is the only way we can do that. Jesus has saved us and made us his. He's joined us to him. He's joined you, Christian, to him and he has secured your present and your future you we have a certain inheritance imperishable undefiled and unfading this is first peter chapter one kept in heaven for you by god not kept on earth for you by the senate and the supreme court kept in heaven for you by god So I, we don't need this stuff or this place. Now, do we want it? Yeah, it's good. And, and it's a good gift given to us. And, and we should engage. We should not be at all detached. We should engage. But we don't need this stuff or this place. You're in Christ and you are filthy, stinking rich. All things are already yours. And you don't need an identity here established by your rights and privileges as an American. I love America. I, I love being an American. But let's be clear, we don't need this. You are a member of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people that God chose to make his own possession. You don't need the United States. You have a kingdom. I love the United States. I don't need it. We, in fact, can be aliens and strangers and exiles here like we are. We can be, along with the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians, treated like the scum of the earth. Because you're not. And you know it. You're a chosen people. God's own possession, the apple of his eye. That's who you are. And all of this is yours. And so we can live. That's why and that's how. Setting our minds on that, on Jesus who is and who has won that for us and that that is coming. That's why and how we can submit here to fallen, foolish, and even unjust human government. And that's going to stand out increasingly in an increasingly polarized country. You notice that everyone else here is playing the political game for keeps in a zero-sum world. Everyone else here looks across the aisle in Congress or across the street at the protest and realizes if they win, I lose. And it is winner take all. If they win, I lose. And they can't afford to lose because this life is all they have all they have to live for, and all they have to enjoy. To lose equals death, and so the world is fighting to the death, and will increasingly so. That's what's going on in the newspaper every single day. That's what's going on in Congress, and every other street in this land right now is a war, 
And we alone are really uniquely positioned in the middle of that to show something totally different. Not everyone's going to see it, of course, but, but some will. And when they have eyes to see and they look, we must be showing what God wants them to see. This is God's will. How God aims to make himself known and seen to be powerful, to show off Jesus as making a difference in people's hearts. That always particularly, the difference always particularly shows up when things go south. It just in everything in life. Everybody's doing great when things are going great. The difference shows up when things aren't going great. This, if you can imagine such a hypothetical scenario like I just imagined us earlier, that's the perfect opportunity. The perfect opportunity for God to show something different about Jesus in Jesus' people. And we can live that. We can live 13 and 14 because he has set us free to do so. Verse 16, this is the great truth of the Christian gospel. We're in Christ set free, not free to do whatever we want, of course. Not, not free to be a law unto ourselves. He's set us free. Jesus, who is God, our Lord, became himself subject to people. Foolish and ignorant and evil people who lacked principle and who lacked wisdom and were full of bias and unjustly executed him. It was the greatest miscarriage of justice ever. Government gone wrong in the worst possible sense. And he did that willingly to set us free. Free from the penalty of sin, yes. Free from the, the need to please God with our behavior, yes. And in particular here, free from sin's control of us so that we can no longer, we can say no, we can walk away from living as slaves to sin and slaves to self, living for this world. We can walk away from that and instead live as servants of God. Trusting in what he has provided, banking our hope on what he's given and secured. Free to live for his sake. Free to live verses 13 and 14, which is his will for us. We are slaves of Christ, and so then our hearts are at rest here. We trust him, and that's going to show up when we bump into other people. We ultimately are trusting him, not them. And so we can honor them, all of them. The passage ends with a command to honor all people. And notice, look, take a look at that last verse. There are four commands there. The first one and the last one are honor. Honor all people. Honor the emperor too. Give honor to people according to whatever they are, whatever their status is, which means at least give them the dignity and respect due their position. Respond to them like they should be responded to. And when we're talking about the authorities here, we, we should commend them. We should praise them when they do what is right, when they, up, when they uphold society, when they put down evil, when they lift up good, when they incentivize proper things. We should say, we should look for that and praise it on purpose. Honor all people, including the crazy evil emperor. Honor on both ends. But in the middle... Love and fear. Love and fear is not on the ends. Love and fear is in the middle. Love the people of God and fear God alone. Honor all people, including the crazy emperor, but love the people of God. This is not, in other passages, of course, we can see we're commanded to love other people. It's not saying don't do that. It's saying I got a context here. I'm talking about allegiances. To honor them is different than to love the people of God. They are your first priority. That's where your affinity lies. And to honor the emperor is different than fearing God. He alone is the one we fear. 
He holds our attention. He grips us. He's the one we're concerned to please and live for and obey. And for his sake, in the fear of him, we subject ourselves to every human institution that as model citizens, we can commend the one who saved us, what he saved us to, and how he leads us, and anyone else who will come follow him. Let me pray. Father, help us, please. Some of this, when we get into the weeds, gets hard. Uh, the whole theory is hard, but when we get into the details, it gets very personally challenging sometimes. Will you help us? Will you particularly minister to your people here such that the reality of you being for us, of you securing us in our future, of you setting us free and giving us power to follow you, it, those, those realities, Lord, have to sink in. So please, Spirit of God, press them home to us now. You make us to be model citizens for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of your name. And it is in that name that we, in confidence and in joy, pray. Thank you. Amen.